Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Sarah, and it's Tuesday, so I spent part of my weekend talking to another author, which is a very cool way to spend a part of your weekend. Uh, at least it is for me, and hopefully it's a very cool way to spend a part of your midweek whenever you listen to the podcast of the interviews. This week, I spoke with Mark Bergen about his debut novel called Apprehension. And I have to say that the book is called Apprehension, and it's about police, and I knew this going in. And for some reason, though, I kept thinking apprehension as in, you know, when you're apprehensive or uh, fearful or concerned about something. And then there was a chapter called Apprehension, and they were talking about um arresting a suspect or bringing someone in uh what have you and i was like oh apprehension <laughs> and yeah i okay uh that's just my my confession to you that i was having a moment of completely thinking of the wrong word although there could be some apprehension in this book as well for various reasons so it could be a play on on that word and its uh, multiple meanings at any rate the book uh, follows the story of Detective John Kelly. He was a pro until his niece was murdered right before his eyes. Now Kelly must hide his one shocking secret and criminal act of vengeance when fellow detectives digging in another case can end Kelly's career and send him to jail. Kelly must ignore this looming threat and focus on protecting a boy from his pedophile father. Except the hotshot defense attorney is his new girlfriend, Rachel Cohen, who shares wonderful news but hides her duty to destroy him on the stand. And she can't reveal she's investigating a twisted team of drug cops. While his friends work in secret to save him, Kelly is forced to the breaking point and beyond. This book, there's a prologue that takes place a year prior, but then the, the bulk of this book takes place over the course of uh, like four days, and then there's a, there's an epilogue that takes place a little bit later. But the bulk of the book takes place over four days, and these are some crazy, action-packed days. I mean, I am... Um, it just it, everything that John Kelly goes through, everything that pretty much all of the characters go through, because there there's different elements of the story that you see through different characters' eyes or through a different different lens, and it it's a fascinating look at um, police work, police life. It does take place in 1988, so it's also a fascinating look at uh, police work in a time before cell phones, before uh, desktop, laptop computers, etc., before the internet. So uh, a fascinating look at a, at a period of history that's not that far past, but still uh, far enough past that we tend to forget some of the conveniences we have now. But just the amount of action in the book and i mean that by in terms of both like physical action you know the action of a car chase or um a, a drug bust or an arrest or what have you as and as well as the emotional action of the book there's a lot of things that happen in terms of the relationships and how the main character and some of the secondary characters are navigating those relationships how everything is all intertwined i mean John Kelly, the main character, is a police officer. He is dating the uh, public defender who, they, you know, so they obviously come across each other against each other in court. This has an effect on their relationship, as does a few other aspects of their relationship that, uh, that you find out throughout the four days. I mean, it kind of makes me tired just thinking about it in these four days. Wow. At any rate, it it is uh, quite the 
the full set of four days. And rather than me continuing to ramble on about those four days and about this book, we should turn and find out what Mark would like to say about his own book. Before we get to that interview, I do have copies to give away. So stay tuned until the end of the podcast to find out how you might enter to win a copy of Apprehension by Mark Bergen. In the meantime, let's go ahead and turn now to that interview with Mark. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me. I am very excited to have you here to talk about your new book, Apprehension. Before we get to the book, though, um, if we could get to know you a little bit, that would be great if you could share something about yourself. Sure. Um, This is my first book. Um, I I retired police officer. I retired six years ago. I had to retire. I'll get to the story on that in a little bit. Uh, I had been a newspaper reporter before that. I uh, was born and grew up in Philadelphia, and I'm now in Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, thank you for that. So um, can you give a quick overview of the story in Apprehension? The theme of Apprehension is <laughs> police stress and the effects that it has on officers, leading them almost to the point of suicide. It's the story of a detective named John Kelly and the four best and worst days of his life. We meet him while he is preparing to go to trial to send away a uh, pedophile, a pedophile who was about to prey on the man's own son. So Kelly needs this trial to protect the kid. But while he's getting ready for this, he learns that a stupid and terrible thing that he did about a year ago is about to be unearthed. It'll probably cost him his job. It may send him to prison and there's nothing he can do to stop it. So he has to continue with his uh, his trial prep. And another wrinkle in this trial is that the defense attorney is Kelly's secret girlfriend. They've just sort of started together and she has both a wonderful secret to tell him right now and a terrible secret she has to spring on him at trial. Yes, it is um, quite the four days for John Kelly. Um, <laughs> I, I want to say it, it's a bit of a um, a storm that, with an S word in front of it that I can't say on the podcast. Okay. Um, so, yeah, everything kind of dumps down on him all at once. And what was your inspiration for the story itself? About um, About 30 years ago. When I was an officer, I was in a drug unit and I was under a lot of stress myself. Uh, It was very hard work. I was working 56 hours a week, 50 or 60 hours a week on the street, maybe another 20 or so in court because we arrested a lot of people. Uh, I was going through a divorce and having a very bad time of it. So suddenly, although I'd always wanted to be a writer, I had never written fiction. I'd never tried. But suddenly a bunch of ideas sort of popped into my head and I was fortunate enough that I wrote them down and then completely left them aside for 30 years. When I had to retire, I pulled them out and fleshed them out, took about a year to write the novel, took another year to polish the novel and (laughs) took about another two years after that to sell it. And during all that selling time and pitching and looking for agents and looking for publishers, I was constantly reopening it to make paragraphs a little tighter, to improve dialogue, things like that. So it took a long time to write. Mm -hmm. Is that why the book is set in uh, 1988? A couple of reasons. Yes, that's very much when I envisioned it. Uh, If anybody in the book had cell phones, none of the conflicts would occur. So I had to write before cell phone time. In fact, one time I I sat down and rewrote it to bring it up to modern times, and everybody was either constantly dropping their phone or leaving it behind, or the battery died, and it read stupid. Also, (laughs) I very much wanted it to be a realistic book. I wanted it to be be as true as fiction could be, and a key twist in the story deals with a certain law about parental abduction, and how that law was framed changed right after 1988. So I wanted to set the book at a time when 
what I was describing was true. Mm-hmm. And this this really has nothing to do with the with the story itself. But <laughs> for, uh, what part? I, I laughed at the scene where uh, John, the main character, was having a bit of a meltdown, and he. <laughs> wanted to he, he thought about picking up the selectrics the green selectrics typewriter um That's and another smashing it and first i was laughing at the selectrics typewriter which you just don't see anymore and then also i was laughing because he was like but he liked that typewriter so he didn't do it well uh, that's one that's one of the very true stories i love electrics uh, i was a newspaper reporter for four years and we used electrics a lot i just like the rhythm of it but that's another reason why i couldn't make it modern times i would have had to get rid of that little moment. And I like that moment. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, um, so let's talk a little bit more about the protagonist, um, John Kelly. He basically goes by Kelly throughout the book. What about him do you think might resonate with readers? I hope that my fellow cop readers will read this book and be able to say, yeah, that's really what it's like out there. That's what we go through. I as long as I've envisioned it, and in all of my writing, I wanted this to be a book that cops would see as true, or at least truthful, that they might be able to share with their family and say, hey, you want to know what we go through? This is a book that kind of describes it. And maybe someone who's thinking about becoming a cop can read it and <laughs> maybe have a better handle on what, what to avoid as they go through their career. Mm-hmm. Did you have... Um, friends who were cops who were beta readers or anything? Uh, a couple. And they helped me with details. I, I had the wrong kind of cars. I had to go back and talk about some of the radio procedures and the identifying codes back then because they change all the time. All right. um, I had one, <laughs> a recent beta reader, uh, a, a lieutenant that I worked for when he was a sergeant and I was just an officer, tell me he one of the things he disliked about the book was the manipulations by the officer and the dishonesty. Now, I don't think they're dishonest, but I think the characters try very hard to help each other. It's not that thin blue line that gets a lot of media attention. Um, nobody's out and out lying for each other or covering things up. They're just seeking to make sure everybody has the best help they can get try and slant things to to help the officers right right um so a lot of this is from your own experience being a police officer did you do particular research maybe just to refresh your memory or was there any other kind of research you did um it was almost all memory refreshment uh, most of the story just popped out of my head it's all fiction but there are a number of scenes that are true um the witch doctor is a true story with, yeah, with, okay. with the names changed um, okay some of the other events everything in the book could have happened and some of it did uh i have to make clear the magnets didn't happen i won't okay. talk about the magnets our people can read it but what right. what i described we did with magnets we didn't actually do we talked about it but we didn't do mm. it mm-hmm well, that's probably good. Um, yeah, the the witch doctor story, I don't want to give it away, but that was, it was fascinating, a little bit funny, and also just like, wow. Um, um, the, the, the criminal justice system is very big and very complex and very diverse and very busy, and things get lost. So maybe the witch doctor just sort of helped things get lost. Right. Uh, there's never been an explanation for what actually happened in the real case that's based on. So. Wow. That's fascinating. But let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll talk about more of how Mark went about writing some of the autobiographical elements of the book, what's fictionalized, what um, maybe happened to him, maybe happened to other people. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. 
Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden in the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further because this is the gold standard in music podcast. Welcome back to the GSNC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Mark Bergen about his debut novel, Apprehension. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Um, you have, you've touched on this, but how, you, so there, there are definitely autobiographical elements in the book, but how did the, the writing process go for you where you decided what to include that was autobiographical, what um, to bring in that was fiction? Um, that's a, that, that's a challenging question. I, I sort of, the things that were autobiographical, I manipulated some of the circumstances. Very, very little of it is truly autobiographical, but many of the things happened to officers around me or, uh, that I learned of by talking with officers. So it it is all fiction, but but much of it's true. The officer, there's a description of an, of an officer being robbed while on mm-hmm. a drug operation. That happened. That was mm-hmm. that was a shock to us all when that happened. Yeah. Um, how I resolve it in the book, unfortunately, didn't happen. I have a better resolution in the book than real life, which yeah. which I guess is something we all want to have. Right, right. We'd all like to be able to rewrite things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned at the beginning the, the the stress level that can often lead to um, a lot of different complications for people in this line of work. Um, one the, the, the worst of which, of course, would be suicide. In the afterword of your book, you talk a little bit about that and um, what what the book is doing for that. Can you talk more about um, about what you say in the afterword? Yes, thank you. Um, when I sat down to write the book, part of my goal was not only to tell a story, like I'd always wanted to, I wanted to write a book since I was a little kid. And like I say, I had the idea for this book 30 years ago and set it aside. But when I put pen to paper, it was with the idea also that maybe I could do some good with this, not just sell books, not just get a big uh, publishing contract and then a movie contract and all the other wonderful things that happen to one one thousandth of one percent of us writers. But I had a very interesting thing happen to me that ended my career. Six years ago, I had two heart attacks. Mm. In fact, um, I died. The doctor called it sudden cardiac death. I was at a beach house in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, sitting on the deck and woke up flat on my back with no idea how I got there. Spilled my oh, coffee wow. all over Spilled my coffee all over myself going down. Didn't have pain, didn't have shortness of breath, didn't have any uh, vision problems. Just just instantaneously went from sitting up to flat out. Went and found my wife. She said, you've been on vacation for a week. You've drinking nothing but beer, co- beer and coffee. You're dehydrated. Drink some water. If it happens again, we'll go to the hospital. So two hours later, it happened again while I was walking around. And I went down face down. Oh. Uh, Found her. She drives me to the little clinic. They can't find anything wrong with me. Heart attacks typically are an injury. And it, as an injury, there's an enzyme that's that's secreted. So they can test for that enzyme and see if you had a heart attack. I didn't have that. I didn't hmm. have any apparent heart arrhythmias. But the I'm sitting in this clinic in a vacation town and an ambulance pulls up out front. I say, boy, someone's having a worse week than me. And they say, no. That's for you. You're going to the you're going to the bigger hospital. The nurse, and the, the nurse looks at me and says, "I'm going to pray for you." And that's mm. that, 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 that's not that's not a reassuring thing. Uh, I, go, I go to the hospital. I meet a cardiologist. By the way, it's weird having a cardiologist now, um, who asks me questions and says, "You spilled coffee on yourself 
but nobody ever spills their coffee when they're fainting. They've always got that second or two to put it down as they go out. This is something different. He gave me an angiogram, which is where they squirt dye through your arteries, and they found a 100% blockage of the main coronary artery. Oh, my uh, gosh. The artery is called the LAD, and that blockage is called the Widowmaker. And I got to hear that term over and over again as I moved from that hospital to another hospital to the emergency room of the heart hospital to the cardiac care. They always ask you, why are you here? Do you know, do you know what happened to you? And I'd say, I had 100% blockage of the left anterior descending. And their eyes would get really wide. And if they knew I'd been a cop, they were a bit more blunt. They'd say, that's the widow me. You're, you're, that should have killed you. I had one nurse put her hand on my shoulder and say, you're not supposed to be here. God must have something more for you to do. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's my image of God, but I thought about it. Mm -hmm. when, it when I finally had to retire, and I had to retire because I ended up with uh, double bypass surgery, and my doctor and the city doctor said I couldn't go back into the stressful world of police work. So I knew I had, I had, knew I had to do something. I decided to write. But that's when I decided, what can I do that's better than just writing? And I decided to dedicate some of my profits to programs that combat police suicide. It's a problem. More cops commit suicide than are killed on duty, at least twice as many usually. This year so far, uh, there have been 71 line of duty police officer deaths. And by police officers, I mean everything, all kinds of law enforcement, sheriff's deputies and special agents and stuff. But mm -hmm. there have been 120 victims of suicide. Oh, in the wow. And in my area, in Alexandria, in the 28 years I was a cop, one officer was killed in a shootout, but three officers shot themselves to death. And in that same mm -hmm. period, two sheriff's deputies in our city. So that's five to one. That's a higher ratio than than the national, but that's not terribly unusual. Always more cops are killing themselves than are killed out on the street. And there are ways to prevent it, but within our culture, there are things that sometimes prevent us from getting that help. Mm -hmm. Cops are reluctant to admit they need help. They're, they don't want to call a psychiatrist or go to the city for that because they worry about losing their job. Uh, as it happens, after I had written the book, but while I was still researching the topic, I got to hear a lecture by the uh, National Police Suicide Foundation, and they're going to be my first recipients of money. They impressed me. They do two things. They teach police agencies around the country how to recognize stress PTSD, how to mitigate it, how to help their officers through it. And they also operate a no-tell helpline, a hotline that cops can call without getting ratted out to their agency. So they're mm -hmm. going to get, um, right now, about 50% of my profits, which isn't a whole lot of money yet. The, books, the book is just barely showing up. But, right. But I like well, it what just they, came out, right? Yes, it did. Uh, it, okay. Technically, it came out last week, and the orders are, are starting to come through now. It's it, it's it's an ebook, but it's on Amazon and it's on Barnes and Noble, and the publisher Quill uh, has it available too. So it's mm -hmm. starting to show up, and especially through nice people like you who are helping me get the word out. My publisher <laughs> is very small, and we don't do much marketing, so, so right. I get to talk a lot. <laughs> Well, it depends. If you like talking, that's great. <laughs> if not, you might be like, oh, Lord. Um, I'm, go ahead. No, I just, I, I'm, I'm getting a little more comfortable about it. I don't, I don't like talking about myself, but I'm glad to talk right. about it. I want to talk about the, the topic because it doesn't, yes. get, it doesn't get the attention that it should. Absolutely. And you talk, you know, there, there's, there is that element of the story, and I don't want to give – uh, much away about the story, but even and this is this is 30 years ago, and it doesn't feel like things are that much different now in terms of, you know, officers still don't want to call the employee assistance program, or they still don't want to admit 
that they have any sort of weakness because then they aren't seen as being maybe strong enough to be in the line of work that they're in. So it's definitely, I can definitely see that it would be a problem um, a, that needs to be addressed. There's a bit of a shift now and things are getting better now. A couple reasons. Uh, social media. Although social media can generate a tremendous amount of pressure on all of us with, with the images of cops who get involved in bad things or, or just flat out do bad things or their actions can be misinterpreted. Um, that makes us look bad and feel bad. But mm -hmm. it's also an area in which cops can can draw some strength. There are groups on social media that try to highlight this issue. Uh, agencies have gotten better. We've always had um, stress debriefings on our police department. Not always, but but for most of the time I was a cop, you'd have a critical incident stress debriefing. If there were a major shooting, uh, a really bad call, like like somebody died or a young person died, they would bring officers in and you'd talk in a group. But many agencies, including mine right now, the Alexandria Police Department, are starting peer debriefing groups where it can be one-on-one, -on -one, where the officers can reach out to either a fellow officer or, lucky for me, me as a retired officer. I'm a member of the Alexandria Police Peer Debriefing Unit. So someone who just had something terrible happen, maybe even an off-duty thing, maybe they're going through a divorce, they can call and talk to me. And because I'm outside the chain, I don't have to report back and either get them in trouble or make trouble there. So departments are moving toward improving. I'm hoping this book lets me talk to a lot of police agencies and sort of spur them on or be a catalyst for for talking about these issues. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, so you retired and you started writing. Are you working on another book? Do you have an idea for another book? How's that working? I've got about six ideas for another book. I'm about halfway through the second book. When I was writing the first, ideas would constantly pop into my head. I'm, I'm the kind of person I carry around a notebook and a pen and I'm constantly jotting things down. Uh, ideas would pop in and I could use them in, in apprehension. But some parts wouldn't quite fit in there. So I just write them down as notes and I put them on a computer file and look at them later. And they became the plot for the second book that I'm working on now. And I actually have at least two more books in process with these same characters. Okay. Not exactly a series, since the first one does take place in 1988. And I hope my readers can can, can jump back that far because the people are all the same. There are only a, a couple of different technical differences between back then. The second book is going to take place 12 years later, right after, 13 years later, right after 9-11. And it's going to have nothing to do with 9-11 other than the officers and the department will be going through the changes that all of law enforcement went through right after that terrorist act. Right. The different ways to deal with the public, the different things we were experiencing. Uh, and as it happens, Alexandria, being only five miles from the Pentagon, we had a big impact. That day, I wasn't scheduled to work, but I ended up working at the hospital for crowd control for what we anticipated to be people coming to give blood to support the medical efforts. Uh, we all changed the way our shifts work. We went to 12 hour shifts. I was working midnights. It, 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 it was that was another set of pressures. The second book isn't going to be about pressure. Oddly enough, the second book is going to be about faith and religion and God. Uh, my character survives a horrendous shooting, a shooting that should have killed him. There's no reason for him to be alive. And people around him start to think maybe he's touched. Maybe he was blessed. Maybe he was protected. And again, like I said with me, that doesn't necessarily fit his image of how God works. But he starts to mm -hmm. wonder. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a typical mystery. There's a there's a an, an investigation he's going through. Um, there's a defense attorney who has her own subplot within it. I like to weave a lot of characters together and bring them 
bring them all together in the end, moving along a similar path, but taking different uh, viewpoints of the issues. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that makes me happy because at the end of the book, I was like, okay, well, that's great. We wrapped a few things up, but I still want to know more. <laughs> I'm glad that some of those characters will be coming back. That, that, that's, the most, that's the most wonderful thing you can say to an author. <laughs> maybe, maybe you've said that to other authors, but that's, that, that, that you like the characters, that you're interested in them, that you want to rejoin them in the future. That's, that's mm -hmm. music to my ears. Thank you. You're welcome. And I will say that I have, in fact, said that to other authors, but that does not make it any less true every time I say it. I mean, I am the type of person that falls in love with characters, gets invested in characters, doesn't want the book to end because I want to know more about the characters. Give me a uh, an epilogue that covers the next 300 years and I am good to go. But we do have to take our second break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be wrapping up this interview with Mark Bergen. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today, of course, with author Mark Bergen about his debut novel, Apprehension. And so let's go ahead and get back to that interview. You said that you wanted to write since you were a kid. Um, you, have you been writing throughout your career, or did you just kind of put that on hold until you retired? Well, the wrong kind of writing. I remember wanting to be a writer since I was about... 12. Um, my favorite author was and is Alastair MacLean, the British thriller writer, the author of The Guns mm -hmm. of Navarone and Where Eagles Dare. And my first contact with him was my dad said I could stay up late to watch this movie called The Guns of Navarone. I'd never heard of it. I was a little kid. And it was a great war story. And I learned it was a book. So I went and read the book. And then I read everything else that Alastair MacLean read. And then he was the first author that I reread just to see how he put things together, knowing how it was going to end, but looking for the foreshadowing, even reading just how well he did sentences and paragraphs, his, his, his gift of the language just, just grabbed me right at that moment. Um, I, I, and I, and I read everything I ever could and I read and I read and I read. Then I became a newspaper reporter which is a whole different style of writing. In fact, I had a mystery book store owner one time say, reporters can't be writers. They're just, they'll never be novelists. <laughs> I might go back and find them. And that's not true because there are plenty. But yes. it's a different kind of writing. And my excuse probably was always I'm too busy. Too busy being a reporter, too busy being a young cop and then a middle cop and then getting married and having kids and being a parent and all the other things. I knew, though, that when I retired, I had to have something to do. I'd been 28 years on the department. I was looking to go to go to at least 30. So I was starting to think about retirement. And what everybody tells you is you can't just walk out the door with nothing to do. You can't think, oh, I'll just play golf. Oh, I'll just play tennis. I'll just sit around the house because those are the people that curl up and die. I decided mm -hmm. I wanted to write. I knew I always wanted to write. I 
realized I now had the time and no excuse not to. So I sat down and spent at least four hours a day looking at the screen, if not throwing words onto the screen. But the actual writing wasn't terribly hard at the beginning because because I'd had this story burbling in my mind for so long. Somebody, I wish I knew who, but the best analogy I've heard for how you write a book is you compare it to making a sandcastle. And to make a sandcastle, you start by pulling together a huge pile of sand. And once you have that big pile of sand, then you start making towers and courtyards and moats and 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 walls. So I threw all the words down in the story, just kind of banged it out. I'm a plotter. Have you heard the term plotters and pantsers? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um I, I, I could never be a pantser. I couldn't write a story from the seat of, seat of my pants because I, I wouldn't know where I was going. I have to be a plotter. I have to have the end in mind and work toward it. So I started outlining. I had these notes that I'd written 30 years ago that were basically a, a, a beginning, some middle stuff, and an ending I wanted to get to. And I, I put them on paper. And I thought, okay, how do I get from beginning to middle? What do I fill in? Where does my character have to go to set him up to be at the right place at the end? So that's where the trial came about. That's where the girlfriend came about. Uh, the descriptions of the drug cops and what they go through. It was the drug unit I was on when I first made the first notes for this book. It was called Jump Out Boys, the tactical unit, where we were arresting street corner um drug dealers and drug buyers in the uh basically in the poor communities where where drugs are sold out on the street and it was pure starsky and hutch it was all jumping out of cars and chasing people and exciting but that to be a drag for a couple of reasons nobody nobody thanks you when you're doing narcotics work there's no community that comes out and says oh you're doing a great job if anything it's the opposite You've got the grandmothers who come out and say, why are you doing that to these boys? It's the only way they have to make money, mm-hmm. which is a little startling and, and hard to hard, hard to get through. And drug enforcement, we did a good thing because we kept the lid on a dangerous part of the community or a danger that, we, that could build in the community at a time when it was really, really ripping up a lot of cities on the East Coast. Uh, D.C. had something like 572 homicides in 1988. We had six. Oh. Uh, they're right across the river, so we, so we look at them a lot. The, yeah. the, the drug trade tremendously accelerated the violence in some of the communities. So we kept that down because we could have been anywhere. We were jumping out all the time. There were five different neighborhoods that we could operate in on any given night, and we usually hit at least two of them a night making two, three, five, eight felony arrests each night. And they all end up in court, so you're there. But at the end of two years on that unit, when I found myself arresting some of these guys for the third time, where I'd gotten them convicted and sent to prison the first time, and they come out after a short sentence, do the same thing, I send them again. They come out, do the same thing. And I send them for the third time. I kind of decided that all I was doing was giving a bunch of kids felony records. I wasn't really stopping them or the drug trade in the city. Uh, I wasn't helping. It had to be done, but I didn't want to do it anymore. So I I went back to being a regular patrol officer and did all the other good stuff that the cops get to do. Became a sergeant, was a public information officer, was a training officer, became a sergeant, became a lieutenant. And I was a lieutenant when I uh, when I retired. So out of your out of experience, um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Um, write, just write. There's no re- there's no correct way to write. Uh, there's nobody who can tell you this is the path that you must take in order to be a success. Um, Get in front of a computer screen, 
get a notebook, get a spiral notebook and write some ideas. Have faith in yourself. Um, I had no idea whether anything I was writing was going to be any good at all. Uh, and my first beta readers, my family, of course, they love it because they're because they're my family. What are they going to say? Mm -hmm. uh, but but people did eventually give me some good feedback and support. But you're not going to have that at first. You're just going to have you, a brand new writer, sitting alone somewhere, scribbling, putting ideas down and wondering whether they're any good. They are good. They're your ideas. They're, they're, they're valuable. They're wonderful. Stick with them. And then at some point, screw up your courage and show them to somebody else. There are writers groups in every community and social media lets you connect with them more easily. The, the library, your local library might have a, a writers group or your favorite English teacher from high school or your neighbor who's a big reader. Or the librarian, somebody can look at what what you're writing. So you have to prepare yourself for that and steal yourself for that, and hope that it's a positive experience. But it should be. They're your thoughts, and anybody can write. If I can write and get a book published, anybody can write. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned Alistair McLean as your favorite author. Do you have other favorite authors or genres when you read? Well, going back to my original um, favorites, Alistair McLean, Adam Hall, The Spy Stories, uh, Jack Hunter, who wrote The Blue Max, is one of my favorites. Uh, John D. McDonald has always fascinated me. But unfortunately, all those guys are dead. The good writers out today, uh, I try to operate within the police procedural and mystery genre. I've been told I'm not a thriller writer because I don't have a villain. There are no villains mm. in police. I'm not, I'm not ever going to write a, a, a serial killer story because they're, they're a bit fantastical. But um, there's a writer named Dana King here in Northern Virginia who writes a really good series about a small Pennsylvania town and its police department. Um, E.A. Amar Writes he's been on the podcast. Stories. Yes. Huh? Really? Yeah. Oh, he's fantastic. He is. Um, I'll loop back to him after I talk about some of the other writers, but he he changed my life. But uh, his books are among the most exciting I've ever read. And his was probably one of the only books in the last three years that I read in one sitting. I just did not get up once I started reading. The second book in his The Dead trilogy we're still waiting for the third um mm -hmm. his latest is uh, the unrepentant which is fantastic yeah. Yeah. um angie angie kim uh, a new writer just wrote a fantastic book called miracle creek that if i told you it was about motherhood you wouldn't understand at all but it's a fantastic mystery uh, courtroom drama that keys very much on motherhood and love and women and children. And it, it, it's, it's a fantastic story. She's a great writer. Uh, David Swinson writes cop stories in Washington, D.C. And a brand new writer named Patricia Harmon just came out with a book last week <laughs> with what I thought was the worst title ever, The Hooker, The Handyman, and What the Parrot Saw. But... <laughs> Well, it, it it grabs your attention. It does. It does. Uh, and her writing grabs your attention because it's the most erotic book I've ever read in my life within the structure of a police procedural. It, it, it's fantastic. She hates when I say it's um, Fifty Shades of Silence of the Lambs. But <laughs> it is, and it's good. So there are a lot of nice. I'm in Alexandria, Virginia, which is across the river from Washington, D.C., and this area is full of writers. I mm -hmm. met Ed Amar at a conference called Thriller Fest in New York about three years ago. He was doing a panel on noir type stories, and that was at a time when I was trying to figure out how to define mine, and he was there, and he had mentioned that he was in D.C., and I talked with him after. He invited me to an event called Noir at the Bar, which mm -hmm. we have around here, where writers will read a short 
selection either written for the event or a piece of their up upcoming book. And I got to know writers. And the writing community is fascinating. Everybody's in, co in competition with each other, but they're not in any way competing. There are lots and lots of books out there. And just readers don't buy one book. Readers buy lots of books. So we can all pull together. And they've been really supportive. They've talked me through. They've helped me with uh, some issues with trying to find an agent, trying to find a publisher, um, just trying to keep working when you're stuck in the story and the other one doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Yeah, it's great. Wonderful. Yeah, I've heard um, uh, you're not the first that has talked about that community um, out there. So that that just sounds wonderful. It's nice to be in an area that has so many other authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I know you have a website. So if you can uh, tell us where to find your website and where people can find you on social media, if you have it. I do. Um, I'm on Facebook. I think I'm Mark Bergen 54, but I also have a Mark Bergen writer Facebook page that I only started a few weeks ago, so it's not really well populated. I haven't quite figured out how to separate my personal persona from my writing persona, and I want to do that more. I have a website called markbergenwriter.com um, that was a blog site. I started about two or three years ago, wrote about 15 items, and forgot about it for until, until about a month ago. I just wrote something new. And I'm trying to revitalize that. Um, I can be reached on my website, which is in the back of the book. So I'm trying to encourage people to to write to me from that. Uh, if they don't like the book, I want them to tell me. If they do like the book, they can tell somebody else. But <laughs> right. my, my email is uh, bergenwriter at gmail.com. And Bergen is B-E-R-G-I-N. None of this Candace Bergen with an E stuff. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> good to know. Um, and then we've talked about a bunch of things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to highlight, either from your book or or writing in general? Gee, <laughs> um, that's a, that's a very wide uh, wide. <laughs> it is, but just in case there was something you were like, shoot, I really wish she'd asked me that. Nothing I can think of right at right at this second. Um, I think you know you were kind enough to give me questions that let me talk about my cause, if you will, the the suicide prevention. Describe the book a little bit. Uh, talk about the ones that are coming. Um, talk about some of my friends who have also written not also written great books, but they've written great books and they've, they're also writers. I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you're anything like me, you'll think of something like uh, two hours from now, but that, that's just me. So um, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I really enjoyed speaking with you. It was very much my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. Once again, thank you so much to Mark Bergen for taking the time to speak to me about his debut novel, Apprehension. I very much enjoyed our conversation. I am grateful, as always, to all the authors who take time to come onto the podcast. Grateful, as always, of course, to you, my listeners. And if you are interested in this book and would like to enter to win a copy of it, you can do so by going to our Facebook page. Twitter or um, Instagram pages, so GSMC Book Review social media pages, and commenting on the post that has this episode, which is episode 174, um, obviously interview with Mark Bergen. So GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, comment on this post interview, uh, excuse me, episode 174, and you will be entered to win a copy of Apprehension. Thank you so much for uh, joining me for this interview, this episode. I hope you'll join me again next time. Hope you're having a wonderful week and um, that you take some time this week to go out and get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts 
Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.